When you think of inescapable prisons, notorious facilities like ADX Florence or the White Dolphin Prison come to mind, places where inmates only leave in a body bag. However, those high security institutions are primarily designed for men. But what about the prisons built for women, especially those who've committed crimes so chilling they can make even the hardest man's skin crawl? In this video, we'll take a deep dive into the most secure prisons in the world, built specifically to contain the most dangerous women alive. Federal Medical Center. Federal Medical Center Carswell, one of the toughest federal prisons in the United States. Located in Fort Worth, Texas, this facility is notorious for its stringent security measures and the high-profile inmates it contains. From infamous criminals to shocking incidents, FMC Carswell is a place where the harsh realities of prison life are laid bare. One of the unique aspects of FMC Carswell is its administrative high-security unit. This unit is designated for women in the BOP system who are classified as special management concerns due to violence or escape attempts. The unit has a capacity of 20 women, and as of July 2018, there were 10 women confined in this unit. The prison has seen its share of high-profile inmates, which has contributed to its notoriety. One of the most infamous inmates was Lisa Marie Montgomery, the last woman under a federal death sentence. Montgomery was convicted of the gruesome murder of a young pregnant woman, Bobby Jo Stinnett, in 2004. She cut the unborn fetus from Stinnett's womb and attempted to pass the baby off as her own. Montgomery was executed in January 2020 after a series of legal battles and delays due to her attorneys contracting COVID-19. Another notable inmate was Angela Johnson, who was convicted for her role in aiding her then-boyfriend, Dustin Honken, in committing four drug-related homicides. Johnson was initially sentenced to death in 2005, but her sentence was commuted to life in prison in 2014. Honken, on the other hand, was executed in July 2020. The facility's history is also marked by numerous allegations of abuse, medical malpractice, and neglect. Over a seven-year period, Period, seven staff members were convicted of sexual abuse of inmates. One of the most shocking cases involved correction officer Michael Lawrence Miller, who raped a prisoner in March 2000. The prisoner did not report the incident immediately, but kept a pair of sweatpants as evidence. Miller was convicted and sentenced to 12 years and six months in prison in 2004. If you think this is crazy, then you have not seen anything yet. Our next prison is so tough, a woman was paralyzed for life after a confrontation with the guard. Lowell Correctional Institution. Established in 1956, Lowell Correctional Institution is one of the oldest and largest women's prisons in the United States. Located in Ocala, Florida, it has the capacity to house up to 3,000 women, including pregnant inmates. Over the decades, Lowell has gained a notorious reputation for its harsh conditions, systemic abuse, and neglect. Lowell is a place where you are stripped of your humanity. The conditions are deplorable, and the guards treat you like you're less than human. It's a constant struggle to survive. Over the years, numerous incidents of abuse and neglect have come to light, but it was the brutal beating of Cheryl Weimar in 2019 that truly shocked the nation. Cheryl, who was serving time for a non-violent offense, became the face of the horrors within Lowell's walls. On August 21, 2019, Cheryl Weimar was brutally attacked by prison guards. The assault was so severe that it left her quadriplegic, unable to move from the neck down. According to reports, Cheryl was targeted after she complained of severe pain and requested medical attention. Instead of receiving the care she desperately needed, she was met with violence. The incident sparked outrage and led to a lawsuit against the Florida Department of Corrections. The lawsuit revealed a pattern of abuse and neglect at Lowell, painting a grim picture of life inside the prison. Cheryl's case was not an isolated incident, but part of a broader culture of violence and mistreatment. In December 2019, a Department of Justice report found that the Florida Department of Corrections had been aware of ongoing sexual abuse at Lowell for over a decade, but failed to take action. The report highlighted a culture of impunity where guards could abuse inmates without fear of repercussions. The findings were a damning indictment of the prison system and called for immediate reforms. Now, while this prison is known for being ruthless, I mean, they paralyze someone for life, the next prison on our list has featured a few deaths. HM, Prison Bronzefield. HM. Prison Bronzefield, located on the outskirts of Ashford in Surrey, England, stands as the largest women's prison in Europe. Its history is as complex as the lives of the women it houses. The site where Bronzefield now stands has a long and varied past, beginning as the West London District School in September 1872. This residential school was established for the education of orphans and came under the control of the London County Council in April 1930. By 1931, the school provided residential accommodation for 640 children 
children from the County of London. However, by the time of its closure in 1955, the number of children had dwindled to just 40. In 1961, the site was repurposed as the Ashford Remand Centre, a detention facility for boys aged 14 to 21. The Remand Centre quickly gained a notorious reputation for its decrepit state and the violence that occurred within its walls. Despite its infamy, the centre continued to operate until 1988, when it was closed down. However, due to overcrowding issues in other facilities, it was briefly reopened before its final closure in 1990. Following this, the buildings were demolished, making way for the construction of Bronzefield Prison. Bronzefield opened its doors in June 2004 as the UK's new top security prison for women. Managed by Sodexo Justice Services, it is the only purpose-built private prison solely for women in the UK. Since its opening, Bronzefield has been the subject of media scrutiny for various reasons, including its supposedly lax regime, high staff turnover, and extremely poor industrial relations. Despite these challenges, the prison has continued to operate and even expanded its capacity. Bronzefield has also seen several deaths in custody. Natasha Chin died in 2016, less than two days after arriving at the prison. She had vomited continuously for nine hours and was not given medical attention or her prescribed medication. Expert medical witnesses told a coroner's inquest that if Chin's condition had been monitored and dealt with satisfactorily, she would likely have survived. The inquest jury found her death was due to a systemic failure, which led to a lack of basic care, and her death was contributed to by neglect. In October 2019, a newborn baby died after an 18-year-old. Mother gave birth alone in her cell without medical supervision or help. This case raised serious questions about how the woman came to be unsupervised and without medical support during her labor and birth. Ten or eleven different inquiries have been launched into the baby's death, drawing attention to the care of pregnant prisoners at Bronzefield. While there have been no high-profile names here, the next prison has seen the worst of the worst women in British crime history. HMP Lowton HMP Low Newton, located in Brasside, County Durham, England, has a history as dark and complex as the inmates it houses. Originally constructed in 1965 as a mixed remand centre, it was designed to accommodate 65 males and 11 females. Over the years, the prison expanded, and by 1975, its capacity increased to 215. However, overcrowding was a persistent issue, reflecting the growing demand for prison space in the region. In 1998, HMP Low Newton underwent a significant transformation. The prison was redesignated as an all-female facility, taking in female prisoners from across the north of England. This re-roll refurbishment marked the beginning of its reputation as one of the toughest female prisons in the United Kingdom. Today, Low Newton serves as a maximum security prison and young offender institution, holding a small number of juveniles and life sentence prisoners. One of the most notorious inmates to have been held at HMP Low Newton is Rosemary West. Convicted of 10 murders alongside her husband Fred West, Rosemary Rosemary's crimes shocked the nation. The couple's house in Gloucester, known as the House of Horrors, was the site of their gruesome acts. Rosemary was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1995 and was initially held at HMP Durham before being transferred to Low Newton. Her presence in the prison added to its already fearsome reputation. Another infamous inmate is Joanna Dennehy, a serial killer convicted of murdering three men and attempting to murder two others in 2013. Dennehy's crimes were particularly brutal and she showed no remorse for her actions. Her time at Low Newton Newton has been marked by further violent incidents, including an attack on another inmate. Dennehy's chilling demeanor and lack of empathy make her one of the most dangerous women ever to be held at the prison. Lucy Letby, a former NHS nurse, is another high-profile inmate at Low Newton. Letby was convicted of murdering numerous babies in her care, making her one of the most reviled figures in recent history. Her crimes were committed at the Countess of Chester Hospital, where she worked in the neonatal unit. The details of her actions are harrowing, and her presence at Low Newton only adds to the prison's notoriety. The next prison also has featured some of the worst women in California. California Institution for Women The California Institution for Women, often abbreviated as CIW, has a storied history that dates back to the early 20th century. Originally dedicated in 1932 in Tehachapi, California, the institution was designed to address the growing need for a separate facility to house female inmates. This institution holds one of California's few female serial killers, Dana Sue Gray. In early 1994, Dana Sue Gray embarked on a violent crime spree in Southern California. Gray, a former nurse 
with a troubled past, found herself in dire financial straits, exacerbated by a compulsive shopping addiction. Desperate for money, she turned to murder to fund her extravagant spending habits. Gray's final known murder took place on March 16, 1994, the same day she attacked Hawkins. Her victim was 87-year-old Winifred Winnie Juliana, who lived in the same area. Gray strangled Juliana with a telephone cord and stole her credit cards and jewelry. Once again, she went on a shopping spree immediately after the murder. The spree ended when Gray was arrested on March 18, 1994, after police identified her from the description given by Dorinda Hawkins and traced her recent shopping activities using the stolen credit cards. Gray was charged with multiple counts of murder and attempted murder. In 1998, Dana Sue Gray was convicted of the murders of Norma Davis, June Roberts, and Winifred Juliana, as well as the attempted murder of Dorinda Hawkins. She was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Her case is often studied as an example of how personal issues such as financial desperation and compulsive behavior can lead to violent crime. The next prison we have on our list is one of the worst prisons in the US. Don't take our word for it, take it from the Mother Jones magazines. Julia Tutwiler, Prison for Women. In May 2013, Julia Tutwiler Prison for Women was named one of the 10 worst prisons in the United States by Mother Jones magazine. On January 17, 2014, the U.S. Department of Justice released a report detailing findings of rampant sexual abuse at the facility. The report stated that Alabama was violating the Eighth Amendment by failing to protect women prisoners from harm inflicted by the correctional staff at Tutwiler. The prison had a long history of staff on prisoner sexual abuse and harassment. Women at Tutwiler lived in constant fear for their safety in a highly sexualized environment. This environment included abusive sexual contact between staff and prisoners, staff condoned sexual activities, and profane and unprofessional behavior. Guards often engaged in voyeurism, watching prisoners while they showered or used the toilet. Despite being aware of the situation for over 18 years, officials at the Alabama Department of Corrections and Tutwiler failed to address these systemic issues. In 2016, Governor Robert J. Bentley announced plans to close Tutwiler as part of a broader transformation of the prison system. System, though the facility remains open as of 2020. Notable inmates at Tutwiler have included Linda Lyonblock, Amy Bishop, and Judith Neely. Inmates on death row include Patricia Blackman, Tierra Capri Gobble, and Lisa Leanne Graham. If you think the names in this prison are high profile, check out the names in the next one on our list. Valley State Prison. In October 1999, Valley State Prison for Women gained national attention when journalist Ted Koppel featured it in a Nightline series. The episodes exposed alarming medical practices at the prison. Dr. Anthony D. Domenico, the chief medical officer, made a controversial statement suggesting that female inmates were seeking pelvic examinations for male contact. This comment led to his reassignment to a desk job in Sacramento, yet the prison's reputation suffered a significant blow due to the scandal. Valley State Prison for Women housed several notorious inmates. Larissa Schuster was sentenced to life without parole for murdering her husband by submerging his body in hydrochloric acid. Julia Rodriguez Diaz became the first female inmate to receive a 15-year parole denial under Proposition 9, Marzi's Law, for the murder of seven-year-old Javier Angel in July 1979. Her story was featured in the 2013 Deadly Women episode, Heartless Souls. In 2014, she was moved to the California Institution for Women. Diane Downs, convicted in Oregon for shooting her three children, also spent time at Valley State Prison for Women. The facility's history of housing high-profile inmates, along with the medical practice controversy, has kept it in the public eye. The next prison on our list is also notorious for holding some horrible women. Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. Bedford Hills Correctional Facility for Women, located in Westchester County, New York, is the state's only maximum security prison for women. It has gained notoriety for housing some of the most infamous female criminals in the United States. The prison's notable inmates have included Jean Harris, who was convicted in 1981 for the murder of Dr. Herman Tarnauer, the creator of the Scarsdale Diet. Her trial attracted significant media attention, highlighting issues of domestic abuse and mental health. Pamela Smart, another high-profile inmate was convicted in 1991 of conspiring to murder her husband, Greg Smart, with the help of her teenage lover and his friends. Her case became one of the first highly publicized trials in the age of 24-hour news and inspired numerous books, movies, and television shows. Amy Fisher, dubbed the Long Island Lolita, was imprisoned at Bedford Hills for shooting Mary Jo Buttafoco, the wife of her lover, Joey Buttafoco, in 1992. Fisher's crime and subsequent trial captivated the nation, resulting in widespread media coverage. Mount Joy Women's Prison. 
Mountjoy Women's Prison, officially known as the Dochester Centre, is part of the Mountjoy Prison Complex in Dublin, Ireland. Opened in 1999, it was designed to provide a modern and rehabilitative environment for female offenders, housing women convicted of both minor and serious crimes. The facility emphasizes rehabilitation through education, vocational training, counseling, and addiction services, aiming to prepare inmates for reintegration into society. The Docker Centre is structured like a community, with small living units and communal areas to foster personal responsibility and normalcy. Inmates have access to educational courses such as literacy programs and vocational training in fields like cooking and hairdressing, helping them acquire skills for post-release life. The prison has housed several notable inmates. Catherine Nevin, the Black Widow, was convicted in 2000 for orchestrating her husband's murder in 1996 to benefit financially. Charlotte Mulhall, part of the Scissor Sisters, was convicted in 2005 for the brutal murder and dismemberment of her mother's partner, a crime that shocked the nation. The Gilson and sisters, Gillian and Linda were convicted in 2013 for murdering a local farmer, highlighting issues of domestic abuse. Lo Wu Correctional Institution Lo Wu Correctional Institution is a medium security prison for female offenders located in the New Territories of Hong Kong. Opened in 2010, it was designed to alleviate overcrowding in Hong Kong's correctional facilities and provide a more modern environment for the rehabilitation of inmates. The institution is part of the larger Lo Wu Correctional Complex, which includes multiple facilities. Lo Wu is equipped to accommodate approximately 1,400 prisoners, making it one of the largest women prisons in Hong Kong. The facility aims to provide a secure and humane environment for its inmates, focusing on rehabilitation and reintegration into society. Lo Wu Correctional Institution offers a range of programs designed to aid in the rehabilitation process. These include educational courses, vocational training, and counseling services. Inmates can participate in classes that cover various subjects, including language, computer skills, and arts and crafts. Vocational training programs are available in areas such as hairdressing, catering, and laundry services, helping to equip inmates with practical skills for life after release. The facility's design emphasizes openness and natural light, aiming to create a less oppressive atmosphere. Inmates have access to recreational facilities, including sports fields and exercise areas, which contribute to their physical and mental well-being. Security at Lo Wu is maintained through a combination of surveillance technology and trained correctional officers, ensuring the safety of both inmates and staff. The institution also works closely with community organizations and government agencies to to provide support for inmates upon their release, helping to reduce recidivism rates and promote successful reintegration into society. Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center. In 2003, the facility was rocked by a scandal involving correctional officer Randy Easter, who raped inmate Corinda Martin. The incident highlighted the vulnerabilities within the prison system and sparked outrage among the public and advocacy groups. Both Easter and Martin were sentenced to probation, a decision that many felt was too lenient given the severity of the crime. The scandal was a turning point for the facility, leading to increased scrutiny and calls for change. On February 23, 2004, the Corrections Corporation of America announced that they would not renew their contract to operate the facility, which was set to expire on October 1, 2004. The company cited annual losses of over $1 million as the primary reason for their decision to withdraw. This announcement set off a flurry of activity as the Nevada Department of Corrections NDOC, began soliciting bids for another private company to take over the operation of the prison. The prison also holds some notable women. Margaret Rudin was convicted of murdering her wealthy husband, Ron Rudin in 1994 to gain control of his estate. Kelly Ryan, a fitness champion, was involved in the 2005 murder of her assistant, Melissa James. Kelsey Turner killed a psychiatrist in 2019. Brookie Lee West murdered her mother in 1998 and hid her body in a storage unit. While this prison has some notable inmates, the conditions in there are up to standard, but the conditions in our next prison are way worse. Silverwater Jail Silverwater Jail, officially known as the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre, is a maximum security prison located in New South Wales, Australia. Established in 1970, it was built to meet the growing need for a dedicated women's prison and has since become one of the most secure and notorious prisons in the country. The facility houses female inmates convicted of various offences, from minor crimes to heinous acts warranting life sentences. The prison is designed to provide a secure environment for inmates, focusing on containment, rehabilitation and preparation for reintegration into society. 
society. However, achieving rehabilitation goals is challenging due to the prison's harsh conditions. Silverwater Jail is imposing, with high walls topped with razor wire and multiple security checkpoints. It is divided into several wings, including a high-security wing for the most dangerous inmates, who often face 23-hour cell confinement. The general population wing offers a communal living environment with shared dining halls, recreation areas, and educational classrooms, but overcrowding remains a significant issue. The medical wing provides treatment for health issues, though resources and staffing are limited, impacting care quality, especially mental health services. Despite rehabilitation programs offering educational and vocational training, the harsh conditions and pervasive violence hinder their effectiveness. Inmates struggle with safety concerns and drug addiction, complicating rehabilitation efforts. The staff, crucial for maintaining order, face high stress levels and turnover rates due to the challenging environment. Speaking of environment, the conditions in our next prison are even worse as inmates report freezing cold temperatures at night. Lusk Women's Unit the Wyoming Women's Center, the only women's prison in the state, faces severe conditions and overcrowding. In the winter of 2017 to 2018, inmates endured frigid temperatures as the heating system failed, forcing them to huddle together for warmth in common areas. Former inmate Ashley Houchin, who worked on maintenance, described being frequently woken at night to fix heating issues, while Jamie Lee Dodd recalled being told to wear extra clothes and gather in day rooms to combat the cold. Inmates faced extreme cold even when the heating worked, with some reporting their blankets freezing to cell walls. Overcrowding compounded these issues, leading to punitive transfers to county jails, where conditions were worse. These jails, intended for short-term stays, lacked educational and vocational opportunities, leaving inmates feeling hopeless and warehoused. The facility's deteriorating infrastructure added to the hardship. Ceilings leaked, tiles fell, and inmates often removed them to avoid injury. Despite efforts to address these issues, including awards for quick thinking by inmates, many former prisoners likened the conditions to a stockyard. They described feeling devalued and treated like animals, with some using livestock metaphors to express their experiences. The Wyoming Department of Corrections has struggled with funding and staffing, impacting the prison's ability to rehabilitate inmates effectively. Efforts to improve conditions and reduce recidivism are ongoing, but the challenging environment continues to undermine rehabilitation efforts. If you thought it does not get worse than this, well you are wrong as the next prison is notorious for aiding inmate suicide. Penal de Máxima Seguridad Femenil in 2023, 11 female inmates died by suicide in Ceferesso 16, Mexico's only federal women's prison, highlighting severe systemic failures. These deaths occurred amid mass transfers to the maximum security facility, which lacks adequate medical care and rehabilitation services. The prison, designed to hold 2,528 inmates, was often underutilized until recent government decisions led to overcrowding. Inmates were transferred from various state prisons, many without legitimate reasons. Some women, including those pregnant or with minor offences were sent to Seferesso 16, despite legal protections meant to prevent such transfers. Once inside, they faced extreme isolation, with limited phone calls and infrequent visits worsening their mental health. The prison environment is harsh, with inmates confined 23 hours daily in their cells. Seferesso 16's medical facilities are inadequate, with significant shortages in psychiatric and general medical care. Many inmates self-harmed or attempted suicide due to these conditions, but interventions were often delayed or non-existent. Notable inmates included Rosalinda Gonzalez Valencia, linked to organized crime, but most inmates were not high risk or dangerous. The suicides were a consequence of systemic neglect, lack of psychological support, and failure to address inmates' health needs. The situation prompted investigations and calls for reform, as families and human rights groups demand accountability for the conditions that led to these tragic deaths. For the next prison with brutal conditions, we move to India, where inmates live like subhumans. Tihar Jail. Tihar Jail, located in New Delhi, is known for being one of the largest and most notorious prison complexes in Asia. Despite efforts to provide rehabilitation programs, the conditions within Tihar can be extremely challenging, particularly in the women's section. Overcrowding is a significant issue, with the number of inmates often exceeding the prison's capacity. This leads to cramped living conditions, with multiple inmates sharing small cells designed for fewer people. The overcrowding exacerbates tensions and can lead to conflicts among inmates. The 
prison environment is strict and heavily regulated, with a rigid schedule governing inmates' daily activities. Inmates have limited personal freedom and are subject to constant surveillance, contributing to a sense of confinement and stress. The facilities, while aimed at rehabilitation, often struggle to meet the needs of the large inmate population due to limited resources and staff shortages. Access to healthcare, while available, is often inadequate, with long waiting times for medical attention. Mental health support is also limited, despite the high prevalence of psychological issues among inmates. The pressure of prison life, combined with the lack of sufficient mental health services, can lead to deterioration in inmates' well-being. San Quentin Women's Prison San Quentin State Prison, located in California, is known for its male death row and maximum security units, but it does not have a separate facility for female inmates. The California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation houses female inmates at other locations, such as the Central California Women's Facility and the California Institution for Women. However, San Quentin's infrastructure and operations can provide insights into the broader challenges and conditions faced by female inmates in California's prison system. Women in California prisons often encounter issues like overcrowding, limited access to health care, and challenges related to rehabilitation and reintegration into society. In facilities that do house female inmates, the focus is often on rehabilitation through education and vocational training programs. Inmates can participate in classes to improve literacy, earn GEDs, and learn skills like cosmetology, culinary arts, and office technology. These programs aim to prepare inmates for successful re-entry into society after release. Despite these efforts, the conditions can be tough, with limited resources and over crowded facilities affecting the quality of life and rehabilitation opportunities for female inmates. Mental health support is often lacking, and the stress of incarceration can exacerbate existing psychological issues. The women's experiences in these prisons reflect broader systemic challenges within the California correctional system. Chowchilla Women's Facility the Central California Women's Facility, CCWF, located in Chowchilla, is the largest female-only maximum security prison in the United States. As a maximum security facility, it houses women convicted of serious offenses, including violent crimes and life sentences, without the possibility of parole. The prison's environment is marked by strict security measures, overcrowding, and limited resources, which contribute to the challenging conditions for inmates. CCWF faces significant overcrowding, with the inmate population often exceeding the the facility's capacity. This results in cramped living conditions, with multiple inmates sharing small cells designed for fewer people. The overcrowding can increase tensions and lead to conflicts among inmates, making the prison environment more difficult to navigate. The facility's focus on security means that inmates experience strict regulation and surveillance, with limited personal freedom and autonomy. Daily life is governed by a rigid schedule, with inmates having little control over their activities. This lack of freedom can contribute to feelings of stress and confinement. Access to healthcare and mental health services is limited, with long wait times and inadequate resources affecting the quality of care. Mental health support is particularly lacking, despite the high prevalence of psychological issues among inmates. This can exacerbate existing mental health problems and make it difficult for inmates to cope with the challenges of prison life. Despite these challenges, CCWF offers vocational training and educational programs aimed at rehabilitation and preparing inmates for reintegration into society. Inmates can participate in classes to improve their literacy earn GEDs, and learn skills such as culinary arts, cosmetology, and office technology. However, the effectiveness of these programs is often hindered by the tough conditions within the facility. Behind the fortress-like walls of high-security prisons, the world's most dangerous criminals endure a chilling and intriguing life. While prisons are designed to hold individuals accountable for their actions and protect society, some prison cells have gained notoriety for their inhumane conditions. Join us as we uncover what secrets lie within these inhumane cells, and what does life look Look like for those who've fallen from grace. Morris Mumbucha in Canadian Supermax. Maurice Mombauche's crimes and his central role in the Quebec Biker War represent a chilling chapter in Canadian criminal history. Born in 1953, Boucher initially joined the Hells Angels, one of the world's most notorious outlaw motorcycle clubs in the 1980s. His rise to prominence within the organization would ultimately set the stage for a violent and deadly conflict that would come to be known as the Quebec Biker War. The origins of the Quebec Biker War can be traced back to the lucrative drug trade, particularly the distribution of cocaine and other illicit substances. 
Bauche and his Hells Angels associates sought to control this profitable market in the province of Quebec, leading to intense rivalries with other criminal organizations, most notably the Rock Machine, a rival biker gang. Violence erupted in the early 1990s as both sides vied for dominance. Boucher, known for his charisma and ruthlessness, emerged as a key figure in orchestrating attacks and retaliations. These violent clashes involved bombings, shootings, and assassinations that sent shockwaves throughout Quebec. Innocent bystanders often fell victim to the crossfire, and the death toll climbed steadily. One of the most infamous incidents during the Quebec Biker War was the 1995 assassination of Daniel Desrochers, a correctional officer targeted for his alleged cooperation with authorities. This brazen act of violence further intensified the conflict and drew national attention to the growing menace of the warring biker gangs. As the violence escalated, law enforcement agencies launched extensive investigations to dismantle the criminal networks involved. Boucher was eventually arrested and faced many charges, including multiple counts of murder, drug trafficking, and conspiracy. In 2002, he was convicted of first-degree murder for his role in the deaths of two correctional officers during the conflict. Maurice Mom Boucher's imprisonment in the Canadian Supermax responded to his reign of terror and the need to neutralize his influence within the criminal underworld. Maurice Mom Boucher's life in the Canadian Supermax starkly contrasts the freedom and power he once enjoyed as a prominent figure in the Quebec biker underworld. The Canadian Supermax is a maximum security facility that houses the country's most dangerous and high-profile criminals. Boucher's incarceration reflects the gravity of his crimes and the threat he poses to society. Inside the Canadian Supermax, Boucher leads a highly disciplined and controlled existence. Strict security measures and isolation from the general inmate population characterize his daily routine. He spends much of his time confined to a small, windowless cell with limited opportunities for social interaction or outdoor activities. Surveillance cameras monitor his every move, ensuring he poses no threat to others or attempts to orchestrate criminal activities within the prison walls. Inmates in the Supermax have restricted access to privileges and amenities available in other correctional facilities. Boucher's ability to communicate with the outside world is heavily monitored and restricted, making it challenging to maintain contact with his former criminal associates or exert influence beyond the prison's confines. Additionally, the staff at the Canadian Supermax are highly trained and vigilant, ensuring that Boucher and other inmates are under constant supervision. This level of security is crucial to preventing escapes, maintaining order, and safeguarding the lives of inmates and prison personnel. The bazooka attack on Maurice Mum Boucher is one of Canadian criminal history's most audacious and sensational incidents. It highlights the extent of Boucher's influence and the desperation of his associates and underscores the challenges authorities face in containing his criminal network. In 1997, Boucher was serving time at the Archambault Institution in Saint-Anne-des-Plans, Quebec, when a group of his loyal followers hatched a daring plan to liberate him from the confines of the prison. To execute this audacious jailbreak, they resorted to using a bazooka, a weapon generally associated with military combat rather than criminal activities. The daring attack involved firing a bazooka at the prison's fortified walls to breach its defenses and free Boucher. This extraordinary act of violence and the required level of planning left law enforcement and the public astounded. It showcased the lengths Boucher's criminal associates were willing to go in their determination to secure his release and perpetuate their criminal enterprises. Fortunately for the authorities, the attack did not succeed in freeing Boucher. The prison's robust security measures and swift law enforcement response prevented significant breaches. Nevertheless, the incident served as a stark reminder of the pervasive reach of organized crime and the dangerous capabilities of Boucher's network. In the aftermath of the failed bazooka attack, security around Boucher was further intensified. His incarceration became even more stringent, with heightened surveillance and isolation measures to mitigate future attempts at escape or acts of violence. The bazooka attack on Morris Boucher remains a memorable episode in the annals of Canadian criminal history, a testament to the audacity of organized crime and a chilling reminder of the lengths to which criminals will go to protect their interests and their leaders, even behind the seemingly impenetrable walls of a maximum security prison. Richard Huckle in Full Sutton Richard Huckle's crimes are a dark chapter in the history of child exploitation and online abuse. Huckle, a British national, traveled to Malaysia, where he posed as a Christian volunteer working in impoverished communities. On the surface, he appeared to be a caring individual, but a predator with sinister intentions lurked beneath this facade. Huckle's modus operandi involved gaining the trust of families in these communities, often targeting the most vulnerable. He exploited this trust to access their children, whom he subjected to sexual abuse. What makes his crimes even more disturbing is his 
his meticulous record keeping. Huckle documented his acts in explicit detail, amassing a trove of photographs and notes, which he then shared on the dark web. The discovery of Huckle's crimes was a harrowing revelation. Authorities stumbled upon his activities when they arrested him at Gatwick Airport in 2014. His encrypted computer files contained over 20,000 indecent images of children and a ledger detailing the abuse of nearly 200 children over several years. His actions' sheer scale and depravity sent shockwaves not only through the United Kingdom but across the globe. Huckle's case underscored the alarming reality of online child exploitation. It demonstrated how predators can use the anonymity of the internet to perpetrate heinous crimes and maintain a sinister online presence, making detection incredibly challenging. The case also ignited discussions about the safety of children, both online and in vulnerable communities worldwide. It raised important questions about the responsibility of tech companies, law enforcement agencies, and society in protecting children from such predators. Furthermore, the international nature of Huckle's crimes posed legal and jurisdictional challenges. It prompted calls for greater cooperation between countries to combat child exploitation, as offenders often exploit legal loopholes and differences in legislation to evade justice. In June 2016, Richard Huckle was convicted of 71 offenses involving 22 children, though it is believed that the actual number of victims could be much higher. The gravity of his crimes was reflected in the sentencing. He received 22 life sentences with a minimum term of 25 years before he could even be considered for parole. This was an unprecedented sentence for crimes of this nature in the UK, highlighting the seriousness with which the legal system treated his case. Huckle was incarcerated at Full Sutton Prison, a maximum security facility in Yorkshire, England. This prison houses some of the country's most dangerous and high-profile offenders. The choice of Full Sutton for Huckle's imprisonment reflects the gravity of his crimes and the need to ensure his safety, given the potential threat from other inmates who might seek revenge for his despicable acts against children. HMP, Full Sutton, nestled in the picturesque countryside of Yorkshire, is a maximum security prison known for housing some of the United Kingdom's most notorious inmates. It's a place where the concept of rehabilitation often takes a back seat to the necessity of maintaining strict security measures. Inside these imposing walls, inmates and staff face an environment where fear and violence cast a long shadow. Richard Huckle's presence in the facility only adds to the complex dynamics. The entire Sutton prison is no stranger to high-profile inmates. Men like Charles Bronson, Lee Duffy and Dale Cregan have all called it home at various times. Their notoriety and histories of violence make Full Sutton a challenging environment to manage. These inmates often bring a reputation that can trigger power struggles and turf wars behind bars. Huckle's presence within the prison walls brought its own set of challenges. Other inmates, even those convicted of violent offenses, often view pedophiles with disdain, and prison authorities had to ensure Huckle's safety while maintaining order. Given the nature of his crimes, Huckle would likely have been kept in protective custody or some form of segregation to ensure his safety. Inmates with child exploitation or abuse charges often face threats or violence from other prisoners who seek to harm them. This isolation, while meant to protect Huckle, could also have had detrimental effects on his mental well-being due to prolonged periods of isolation. Strict security measures govern life inside Full Sutton. High walls, razor wire, and advanced surveillance systems are the physical barriers to escape, but the social dynamics often prove most challenging. Inmates here are frequently subjected to stringent routines, limited privileges, and a lack of personal space. This can create an atmosphere ripe for tension and conflict. Reports of violence within Full Sutton Prison have increased, prompting concern among inmates and staff. It's an environment where even correctional officers have sometimes admitted to fearing for their lives. The tensions among inmates, exacerbated by the presence of high-profile offenders, have led to clashes, gang affiliations, and territorial disputes. Liam Dean in HMP Leeds the tragic story of Liam Dean revolves around the heart-wrenching death of his two-day-old daughter, Luna. In 2017, Liam Dean was convicted of manslaughter, a conviction that led to his imprisonment at HMP Leeds Prison. To truly understand the gravity of this case, we must delve into the details surrounding his conviction, the legal proceedings that unfolded, and the sentence he received. The case began when Luna, a helpless newborn, suffered fatal injuries while under Liam Dean's care. This raises the question of how such a terrible incident could occur within the confines of a family home. The following investigation unearthed disturbing evidence of abuse and violence against the defenseless infant. The prosecution argued that Dean's actions directly led to Luna's tragic and untimely death, a claim that the jury ultimately accepted. The legal proceedings that followed were a critical chapter in this harrowing tale. Liam Dean stood before a court of law where he faced the allegations of manslaughter. His defense team likely sought to establish a defense, possibly arguing issues such as intent, negligence, or mental health concerns. On the other hand, the prosecution presented evidence that demonstrated 
demonstrated a direct link between Dean's actions and Luna's death. The courtroom became a battleground of legal arguments, emotional testimonies, and proof that would ultimately decide Dean's fate. Upon conviction, Liam Dean received a sentence reflecting his crime's gravity. While the exact duration of his imprisonment may vary, it undoubtedly serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of his actions. His incarceration in HMP Leeds Prison, a high-security facility, underscores society's commitment to holding individuals accountable for their actions, especially when they involve the most vulnerable among us. Life inside HMP Leeds, where Liam Dean is serving his sentence, vastly differs from what most of us experience daily. It's a place where structure and routine are paramount, starkly contrasting the outside world's freedom and unpredictability. In this confined environment, each day follows a carefully choreographed performance. Inmates like Dean typically start their day early, waking up at dawn. This early start is not a mere choice, it's a mandatory part of the prison's regimen. The day begins with a roll call to ensure all inmates are present and accounted for. After roll call, breakfast is served, and it's usually a simple, no-frills meal. Prisons prioritize efficiency, so breakfast tends to be a quick affair. Inmates are then assigned various tasks and activities to keep them occupied and contribute to the prison's daily functioning. These tasks can range from kitchen duty to cleaning common areas or working in the prison's workshops, where inmates might engage in tasks like woodworking or sewing. For Liam Dean and others, these responsibilities offer a sense of purpose and help maintain the prison's cleanliness and order. In the afternoon, inmates usually have some free time for exercise or recreation. This could involve using the prison's gym facilities, playing sports in designated areas, or simply spending time in their cells reading or reflecting. However, this free time is constantly monitored and regulated to ensure safety and security. However, considering there have been 11 deaths at Leeds Prison since May 2013, the second worst number of prison fatalities in the country, life inside HMP Leeds for Liam Dean is undoubtedly fraught with challenges and dangers that are a far cry from the freedoms of the outside world. Prisons are environments that carry unique perils, both for those incarcerated and those working within the system. Understanding the hazards that Liam Dean may face during his imprisonment sheds light on the complexities and difficulties of life behind bars. One of the foremost dangers within prison walls is the potential for violence. Prisons often house individuals with histories of criminal behavior and tensions can run high. These tensions can erupt into physical altercations, fights, and gang-related violence. For Liam Dean, being in the presence of fellow inmates who may hold solid grudges or grievances could seriously threaten his safety. Moreover, the risk of violence isn't limited to interactions with other inmates. Prison staff often have the unenviable task of maintaining order and security, and incidents of abuse or mistreatment can occur. While strict protocols and oversight are in place to prevent such abuses, they can still happen, leading to a sense of vulnerability for inmates like Dean. Mental health is another pressing concern within the prison system. The isolation, confinement, and lack of personal autonomy can severely affect an individual's mental well-being. For Liam Dean, the guilt and remorse he may feel for his actions, combined with the isolation from his family and society, can contribute to depression and anxiety. Access to mental health support in prison can be limited, making it difficult for inmates to cope with the emotional challenges they face. Additionally, the potential for contraband and substance abuse is a looming threat. Prisons often struggle to prevent the smuggling of drugs, weapons, and other prohibited items. Inmates may be coerced into illicit activities, leading to further complications and risks, including disciplinary actions. The overall living conditions in prisons like HMP Leeds can also be hazardous. Overcrowding, inadequate healthcare, and limited access to education or vocational training can create an environment that fosters frustration and despair, potentially leading to unrest among the inmate population. Click on the card showing on your screen for more interesting videos like this.